A number of years back, um, I had a lot of fun getting to serve as a uh, soccer coach for my boys' YMCA team, and it was a lot of fun. I never played soccer. I stayed in front of them by reading um, Soccer Coaching for Dummies by just a couple weeks, but one of the, uh, the extent that I did it, one of the stories I really remember that was fun to watch in some ways was um, this one boy, I'm going to call him Jeff, to protect the innocent, but he, was, um, he did fine in practice, but whenever we got to games, he would always freak out. And it got to the point where I had to go before the start of the game, and I would tell the referees that I have somebody who's got some special challenges, and I'm going to have, have him come in, and he's going to do the initial kickoff, and then he's going to run to the sideline and be out of the game, and somebody's going to come in for him because he just couldn't be in the game. It just, it, he just couldn't do it. Flash forward about five years later, He's the best guy on the team. He's playing select soccer, all this stuff, just, just amazing. And I'd like to tell you that it was all about the great coaching he received over the, over the three years. But, of course, his transformation from there to there was of just maturing and learning social skills and all the other things that were going on with him where he made this great change, and he was already a good athlete. He just, he just had to tap it. But it was really, really fun to see him go from all the way here to being like the star, you know, it was just really, really fun to watch. And I think transformation's that way. And I think we are in a religion and a faith that's all about transformation. And we probably don't stop enough to talk about it. And we probably don't stop enough to, to present it and, uh, and to really celebrate it. Because God's power in our lives will change us. It will transform us. And that's part of what the Christian journey and message is really about. And there are lots of other parts of Christendom where they're good about you know, having people talk about this power so you can see it. I know one of the, one of the mega churches in town, every single week they have a testimony on their, on their bulletin with some story of transformation from, you know, whether it's the broken marriage back together or a person who's, you know, all these stories of transformation just as a way of reminding us that God is a God of transformation, that God is a God who will change us in amazing and beautiful ways as we go there. And today I want to talk about that in the context uh, of a book of the Bible. And I want to do something I think I've never done. I want to cover an entire book in one sermon without going too long. And I think we'll read the whole thing. Well, actually, we already have. Some of you may know it. There are only four books of the Bible that are one chapter long, and we read one of them today. So Philemon is one chapter long. We read all but the last final three verses and that's the book I want to look at today, and um, it's a book you don't hear preached very often. I'll say something about that. But I love the way it gives us such a window into who Paul is, and really since he wrote the majority of the New Testament, it really gives us a window into the New Testament. And I was interested to see that um, one of the greatest New Testament scholars in the world today is an Anglican bishop uh, scholar named N.T. Wright. And N.T. Wright just uh, recently published a treatise on Paul and his writings and he chose to start this book talking about Philemon because he says that it gives us a window into everything about Paul. And I'm going to follow some of that as we, as we go along. It, but it's, it, the book itself, it, it, there are a number of theories about where it's written and when. We don't need to bog down there. The most prevalent one is that it's written from prison in Ephesus in the year 55. It's not preached on very often. It's, it only makes a rare appearance in our lectionary. But beyond that, I think it's not preached on very often because it's got some hard stuff in it. I mean, there is no way that you can talk about this letter without talking about slavery. And if you have a memory of what's happened in the church, um, it's a, it comes with a dark cloud over this book because this was one of the books of the Bible that was used by Christians to justify slavery in the United States back in the day. So it's got this cloud on it that way, and I think some pe preachers just want to steer clear of it altogether. I want to say a couple things on that, and then I want to get into it, because it's, it's a worthy book that has a lot to say uh, about what God does in relationships and, what, and how, this, how these things work. But, you know, when you think about, the first thing I would say is when, when we talk about slavery back in the time of the Roman Empire, don't think about the wound and scar of North America. Think about something different. Um, this... Slaves were, were at the bottom of the social strata, but they got there from different ways. Like the prevalent ways were they were prisoners of war taken in. Um, they could be children of slaves. They were, there was some kidnapping that took place that went on. Um, but it was also one of the other avenues was 
um, there was no bankruptcy. And if you got to where you were completely saddled with debt and you were never going to be able to pay, you became a slave. That was part of how that went. Um, and there was an immense population within the Roman Empire. But apart from those in manual labor, um, they were, uh, slaves were treated well. One scholar says, think Downton Abbey downstairs. That that was, that was the way people were treated outside of the mines and some of the construction. That was the deal. When it came to uh, sort of the other thing, sometimes people get lost thinking about, well, how come Paul isn't just up in everybody's face about this injustice? And he left it open in a way that church, the church later said he didn't, that he didn't jump up and down must mean that this was okay or whatever. And, and one of the hard things to, to wrestle with, and, and I don't have time to do it all today, but Paul clearly thought Jesus was coming in his generation. And Paul's desire in his writings is to maximize the gospel. So part of what Paul's saying is wherever you are, if you can, stay there and try to spread the gospel where you are because that's the place you'll be most effective and most powerful. And I think that, that bleeds into, the, into this. But don't mistake this. You will see a glimpse of Paul's heart in this. When the, the one time he gets a chance to confront a slave owner, what he does. And we'll come circle back to that in a minute. When we pick up on the story, so there are a number of names mentioned. There are five that were read a few minutes ago. Three of them are the main characters of this story that's taking place. And the thing that's interesting for us, if we're talking about Christianity being this engine of transformation, you can see it profoundly in all three of the main characters of the story. Beginning with St. Paul, and those of you who know Paul's journey, probably most of us know Paul's journey, but, but he has this incredible transformation from where he starts to where he ends. Because if you know where he started, um, he was a Jew's Jew. I mean, he was on it from an early age. He brags about it in one of his letters, um, all the things he did. And then when Christianity began to be, cre uh, be created and, and to bubble up, he was the one leading the charge, trying to stamp it out, persecuting the church. When the very first person dies for their faith, Stephen, he's right there egging them on, encouraging and sort of really overseeing it. He goes all the way from that to his transformation on the road to Damascus where he gets you know, knocked off the horse and bl or gets blinded, spends three years getting trained, and then he becomes this stud church planner that you can read about in the, in the pages of Acts, all the things he does. And he becomes a, a bishop, this apostle in the church, and just the complete transformation to where he gets to the place where he is in prison, full of joy, doing ministry for God. So he has this massive transformation, transformation taking place. And then we come to the second character, which, who is the recipient of this letter, Philemon. And Philemon is, uh, he is a prominent person. He is a man who um, the church is meeting in his house. Um, we learn other bits about him as we go along in the letter. We think, people don't know, but they think these other two names mentioned are related to him. They think that um, Apphia um, is his wife um, and that whether or not it's his son or somebody that's simply just close to him, that Archippus is, is one of those as well. And then we come to Onesimus. And um, to really start to understand Onesimus, you need to think about what he does in the course of this letter, but we need to back up and just kind of look at the story to understand who he is. And the, the thing I would tell you is that like 99.9% .9 of all the scholars agree there's a, a presupposition to what's taking place in this letter today that can be pieced together. And I'm going to walk you through what everybody believes is the story revealed here and some of the pieces that get filled in. The, the first of which is that Philemon owes a great debt to Paul. We see it in, in verse 19. I know you, you were hearing it all at once, and it can be hard to take it in. But he talks about how um, he says, I say nothing about you owing me even your own self. And that's what Paul says to him. And uh, most people think that it means that, that Paul was responsible either directly or indirectly through his ministry for Philemon's conversion to becoming a brother in Christ. So in a sense, he owes him everything. But we know that he's got this, this debt this way. We know Paul's in prison. That's how the letter starts. And then we come to Onesimus, and we, we get that he is a runaway slave. So that, that is what's going on. And he's the one carrying this letter. So, to, so you get that Paul's written this letter. Onesimus, the slave, is returning to his master with this letter in his hand. That's what's going on. Now, the other pieces to know and understand in this is that 
Somewhere in this journey, Onesimus ended up encountering Paul. Whether or not he himself was in prison and God was in prison with Paul, or whether he was in a strange place and had remembered his master talking about Paul and, and said, I'm going to go see him because I know he's here. However it is, they, they encounter each other, and Onesimus converts to Christianity because of Paul. And so he's got that going on. And then Paul clearly, um, and we get that from the scripture where he, where he talks about how he's his son, and how he's begotten him spiritually. But you also get how much Paul loves this man as he writes to Philemon saying, I'm sending you my very heart. I mean, he loves him. And the other piece that we get is that Paul has heard about Philemon's great love and faith. So that's sort of the context of how this thing gets set up. And then Paul tells Onesimus, you need to go back. Now that you've found Christ, where we are, you need to go back, and I'm going to write you this letter. And he does, and he sends him on his way. And one of the things that Paul says in the letter is, if, he, if there's a debt owed here, I'll pay it. And there isn't a lot of discussion about Paul being rich, but some people think this may be a hint that Paul was a person of means. This is one of the few places where we get that hint. But Paul is very much like Jesus here saying, I want reconciliation to happen. I will take, I will take whatever the price is. Put it on my account. And that's where, where he does. And, and the final piece of this story is complete conjecture, but there's reasons for it. And that is that this whole episode played out well. And that Philemon accepted Onesimus. And that, um, I don't know if you caught it, that you know, Paul's hope is actually that, it, that he's not just going to welcome him back. He's not just going to imprison him or do whatever they would have done to a runaway slave. But he's actually going to receive him back and make him a brother in Christ. Because you, you get that line where he, he talks about, I hope you'll do even more. But it's a hint saying, I want you to treat him as a brother. And the reason why scholars think all this went well is because this book is in the Bible. If this thing had been a stunning defeat, didn't go anything like Paul had hoped it would, people think, well, there's no reason this private letter would, it, would have ended up in the Bible. And what we know is that in, in the record outside of the Bible, we know there is an Onesimus who plays a key role some 50 years later. And some scholars think it's the same person. And that he's an old man, but he's the one actually collecting Paul's letters and holding on to them and circulating them. And, of course, he's very happy to keep this letter in the mix because it's about him and it's, it's, it's about the credence he has for his ministry and how this all came about and the power of reconciliation. So I, I think just pa put the pause button here for one moment before we go on and just think about all this transformation. We've talked about Paul's transformation. Think about how much transformation takes place with Philemon and Onesimus because think about uh, Onesimus has gotten away on the, sort of objectively in their society. This, nothing good could come of him returning. What transformation does a person go through where they're willing to say, yeah, I'm going to go back. I'm going to voluntarily go back and find the person from whom I ran away in this social relationship this way. But, my, but Paul, his, his apostle, his father in Christ, is telling him to do it. He's going to do it in humility, and he goes. And, and how much transformation is taking place in Philemon that Paul's hearing about his faith, hearing about um, his love. Paul goes on bragging about how his, his house has learned to be a place of refreshment to Christians. All, the, all that takes place with Philemon changing so that Paul feels comfortable in sending him. Think of all these transformations, these characters. And then we begin to think about the, reconcilia the reconciliation piece of this and what a window this is into what Paul says about reconciliation. N.T. Wright, um, I told you he starts his book talking about Philemon, but he says whenever he teaches his students um, about this, he says the image he likes to make and think about this for all of the New Testament is, is this image. He likes to think about um, Paul's there and he invites Philemon over and he puts his arm around him and tells him how much he loves him, how grateful he is that they're brothers in Christ, all this stuff. And while he's still got his arm around him, he calls Onesimus over and puts his arm around and says, now I want you to, you to know, Philemon, how much I love Onesimus, who is a brother in Christ. My very heart is with him. And now I want you guys to be reconciled. And he says, don't mistake that this image of his arms out like this is the cross and the power of reconciliation bringing them both in. 
and that the whole ministry of reconciliation is the big piece of what the church is about. That Christ came to reconcile us to God. And that he gives us, as Paul will later say in, or, or in 2 Corinthians 5, the ministry of reconciliation. That that's our ministry. Again and again in different ways, that Christians are the ones to step in and to be a people about reconciliation because that's the ministry that God calls us to as a window that we see in all of this. The powerful stuff, but the one thing, the one thing I would say in addition to this for that transformation to take place, for us to really be a people of reconciliation, there is a call with this for us to go all in. And that's what our gospel lesson is about today. It's about that same thing. If we want to experience that transforming power, Christianity is not meant to be a dabbling thing. It's not meant to be a hobby thing. It's meant to be an all, all on. And Jesus is saying that today in the gospel lesson. When he's saying, don't get caught up thinking your relationships are more important than God. Don't think this and this or your possessions, as he says at the end. Don't think any of that stuff is more important than God. It's meant to be the chief thing. And that's where what changes us and, and brings us to a different place of reconciliation in the world. And it's hard stuff. But, you know, I've said it before. If you want your life to be changed, you just want to do an experiment, here's an experiment. For the next 30 days, just pray every day, Lord, I surrender. Do whatever you want with my life. Teach me and guide me. Just that. That one line prayer, the next 30 days, will radically change your life. And then you start asking, well, what, what's he want me to do? And you start reading scripture. and you do it. it will change you. Because we're called to be a people that step into the gap. We're called to be a people of reconciliation. And I think in every generation, that's what we're meant to be. I want to end with a story from many, many, many years ago. Um, this is a story told by the preacher, Evie Hill, that goes back to uh, dark times in our country. And some would say we're, we're still struggling in darker times now with some of the things that are bubbling to the top. This is a, um, a story about some of the tension that took place in the United States around race. And um, e, for those who don't know Evie Hill, he's a, um, he's a black preacher. But he tells this story. Let me just read it in his words. He says, as a freshman at Prairie View College as part of Texas A&M, I was actively involved in the Baptist Student Union. Our denomination's annual convention for blacks at the time was held in Nashville, Tennessee, and it was a highlight of the year. Much to my pleasure, I was one of two students selected to go. White students had raised the money, and that was okay with me, as I viewed it as an act of pity on their part, or at best a chance to ease their guilt conscience. But then real trouble began. The trip through the South was by car, three whites, and two blacks traveling together. I had no idea how we'd eat or how we'd sleep. So great was my anxiety and hatred over how the trip might turn out that I almost backed out entirely. In all my experience, I'd never seen a white man stand up for a black man and never felt that I would. But then Dr. Howard, the director of our trip, and a white man spoke up. He said, we'll be traveling together. If there isn't a place where all of us can eat, none of us will eat. If there's not a place where all of us can sleep, none of us will sleep. That was all he said, but it was enough. For the first time in my life, I had met a white man who was a Christian enough to take a stand with a Christian black man. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us even when we don't deserve to be loved. And that you call us to follow you above everything else and to engage uh, in a ministry of reconciliation. To experience the blessing of being reconciled with you as we surrender. But to be active agents for reconciling the world in its very dimensions of brokenness to you. Help us, lead us, guide us, and strengthen us in that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.